I was only dating Lucas until the minute Todd walked by. Guess that's not very nice, but I used to be kind of like that. We hated everyone. We wrecked stuff, nobody cared. He punched a hole in the moon for me. It was pretty crazy. Before Marvel superheroes dominated the box office, it took a long time for comic books to come to the screen. It was a mix of censorship and studios not really trusting the idea of a superhero movie. One of the reasons why you don't see a lot of mid-century comic book adaptations is because of the comics code. In the 1950s, there was an uproar that comics were leading to juvenile delinquency, and they were heavily censored, just like Hollywood films. So it took till around the 60s and 70s for things to loosen up and more comic books to be on screen. <laughs> One of the great 1970s comic adaptations is Toshiya Fujita's Lady Snowblood. Lady Snowblood is based on a manga, and you can absolutely tell it from the movie. There are very fascinating camera angles. There are animated sequences. This is a movie that is proud to be based on a comic and really trying to bring the visuals of the comic to life. So, what would you little maniacs like to do first? Creep Show is obviously a big tribute to EC Comics, but the one that shared its name was actually Weird Science. Weird Science is very loosely adapted from the comic, and in fact, Joel Silver just really bought the rights because he was a little worried that the story of two nerds making a woman was a little close to Weird Science issue number five, Made of the Future, which involved a man building a perfect wife. Uh, in the same way, though, it really suits Weird Science because it's also this morality tale. It's about a couple of losers kind of getting in over their heads. While John Hughes has a little more silly fun with it, it really suits that EC Comics style. Three, two, Hello, one. <laughs> Comic books also offer the opportunity for a larger-than-life personality to come to the screen, somebody like Pamela Anderson in Barb Wire. Pamela Anderson actually saw Barb Wire as her opportunity to follow in the footsteps of James Fonda. Fonda had done Barbarella, and she went on to be a serious actor, a serious activist, and Pamela Anderson wanted the same thing. While Barb Wire is no Barbarella, it is still a visually interesting movie. It is a fun riff on Casablanca. And I think at the time it was derided because people didn't believe that Pamela Anderson was in on the joke. They didn't seem to understand that she controlled how she was viewed. She cared about this movie and she really saw it as a good experience. Barkeep, another round for my sweet team of super friends. Another interesting adaptation from comic book to screen is 1999's Mystery Men. It was based on the independent Flaming Carrot comics, and those comics were really based on kind of the 1950s heroes and parodying it. And here on screen, you see a real parody of the Joel Schumacher and Tim Burton Batman movies. Mystery Men is not perfect, but it's a very interesting time capsule showing what people associated visually with superheroes at the time. It is a movie that is just so perfectly 90s and such a perfect satire of a very specific kind of film. When am I ever gonna get a girl I drive around in a garbage truck? Wiz left us, Red. Take the hint. We don't take hints. 2004's Hellboy is a great example of comic book artist and director collaborating in artist Mike Mignola and director Guillermo del Toro. Del Toro and Mike Mignola actually started their collaboration with Blade 2, with Mike Mignola designing creatures. And here, I think, in spite of the fact that the movie doesn't carry his signature style, you see a lot of creatures that look very much like his art. An interesting thing with Hellboy is you still see that influence of Hollywood, that reluctance to commit to comic book logic, because they still have a character totally made up for the movie who's a kind of lame audience surrogate, and it feels a lot more like Men in Black than the actual comic. Sarah, this is Victoria. Best wet work asset in the business. A true artist with an RPN. What, what's that? I kill people, dear. 
Post-2008, you see a lot of comic book adaptations that are more using the name and idea of a comic book adaptation than any of the real art or story. For instance, something like Red from 2010. Because studios were equally afraid to gamble on an original idea of a Bruce Willis action movie or a committed dark version of this comic, they sort of split the difference but managed to make a great film. Red is a good example that you can throw away most of the source material but still move with a lot of confidence when you're adapting a comic book and find something at the core of it that is still very fun. Hey. The only thing keeping me and her apart are the two minutes it's gonna take to kick your ass. You dated a famous guy? In ninth grade, we had drama. Actually, it might have been math. I just remember there being a lot of drama. Hey! It was a snot-nosed little brat. He just followed me around. He had snot in his nose? But he's famous. Scott Pilgrim vs. The World is one of the best comic book adaptations simply because it loves being a comic adaptation. While many other comic book adaptations fly under the radar, Scott Pilgrim vs. The World wears its comic inspiration on its sleeve. There's visual onomatopoeia, there's all sorts of comic book frames and cuts. It is the movie that really captures best the energy of reading a comic. It is quick, it's pithy, it just feels like a comic book on screen. Comics and movies will always go together. A comic is basically a storyboard just waiting for an inspired director to pick it up and turn it into a movie. So the next time you watch a unique movie, just know that it might be based on a comic and there may be a little more reading you can do after. What is Scott here? Uh, you know what? He just left. Really? Yeah. Sorry.